If you are a parent and your child tells you that they're being bullied, what you are hearing is the tip of the iceberg. Like other people who are victimized and mistreated, such as uh, victims of rape or sexual abuse, the victims of bullying often feel an enormous amount of shame, self-doubt, and feel that somehow they have brought this on themselves. That means that young people who are willing to talk to an adult about the issue must be truly desperate. So, believe the impact when your kid tells you they're being hurt. Don't minimize it. In fact, in the back of your mind, start multiplying it because whatever they're telling you they're experiencing is probably not nearly as bad as what they are actually experiencing. The whole reason I've spent my life in education is because I don't want any kid to go through what I went through in school. And the thing I find most depressing is that 25 years after I taught my first high school history class in Providence, Rhode Island, I am still hearing from parents and kids who are suffering. I am meeting the parents of children who have died I am seeing that there are still far too many people out there who excuse bullying as kids are mean, or who dismiss the reality of its impact, or who make excuses for not taking action. I think that we simply have to get to a point in America where we understand that bullying is a life or death issue, that it is a form of child abuse, and that it is a human rights violation. Bullying, in the end, is a form of torture. It's an interesting thing to reflect back on your childhood when you're a 47-year-old senior government official with multiple college degrees, because what people see when they look at you is a together, seemingly fine adult. What they don't see is the terrified 11, 12-year-old that I was in rural North Carolina, growing up in a trailer park with a single mother, being bullied and harassed every single day at school because I was a boy who did his homework, because I was a boy who didn't like NASCAR, because I was a boy who didn't do what boys were supposed to do in my town. The easiest thing to call me was faggot or queer or homo. By complete coincidence, I actually turned out to be a gay person. So those words took a special bite out of me. And school, which had been a place that I loved uh, because I was a young person who loved to learn, became a place that I dreaded. On Sunday nights, I would get what my mom called my Sunday funny feeling. I would start getting nauseous. I remember very specifically, we would always watch The Wonderful World of Disney on Sunday nights, and um, they had a theme song. And the minute I would hear that theme song at the end of the show, I would start getting sick to my stomach because I knew it meant the weekend was over and that I was gonna have to go back to school on Monday and face the torment that I had experienced the whole week before. Um, I'm 47. I'm an assistant secretary of education. I have three Ivy League degrees. I'm still coping with the impact of that 35 years later. I still remember the names of the kids who singled me out. I still remember the name of the guidance counselor who, when I approached him, told me, I know those kids, those kids are good kids, I don't believe what you're saying. I remember the name of my ninth grade geometry teacher, Mr. Cobb, who was the only teacher who turned to those kids when they tormented me and said, don't do that and it stopped. 33 years later, I can't remember a geometry proof to save my life, but I remember that moment in geometry class when Mr. Cobb stood up for me and made the mistreatment stop. I think that people who are bullied spend a lifetime coping with the results of that. It leaves lasting scars, it does lasting damage. I think that, how can I put this? I think in the end we need to reframe the whole issue of bullying and understand it for what it is. It's child abuse. And we don't tolerate child abuse in America. What a young person learns when they watch bullying is that they have no power. That they are people who are unable to affect the world around them. And the young people watching bullying are feeling just as awful in many cases as a young person being bullied because they're worrying, am I next? They feel a sense of shame that they don't take action. They feel a sense of powerlessness. And when I think about this situation, I often think about the quote by Martin Luther King, which I'll paraphrase, 
which is that it isn't so much the actions of bad people that we remember, it is the inaction of good people. We need to break the cycle by which good people stand by and enable bullying to continue, whether those good people are principals, teachers, or students themselves. We will never end bullying if people stand by and watch it happen. We know that the majority of bullying incidents take place out of the view of adults. So even if the adults in the community do absolutely everything right, the problem is not going to go away if the students themselves tolerate the behavior. There's an interesting study done in Canada which found that in 57% of incidents where a young person intervened when they saw a peer being bullied, the bullying stopped in less than 10 seconds. So the idea that young people are powerless to do anything about this is simply factually incorrect. I actually feel hopeful about the issue of bullying because of something that might surprise you is because I was a U.S. history teacher. The history of the United States is a history of people who believed they could make their lives better. It is the history of people who boarded ships to come across the ocean because they believed they could create a better world for themselves and their children. It is the history of women who believed that they were entitled to the right to vote and marched in the streets until they got it. The history of people of color who believed they were entitled to the same opportunities as white people and took action till they got it. The history of America is the history of people who believed we could do better and that we could take action that would create a better future. And the lesson of that history is that those people were right. We live in the most democratic society in world history because people have kept pushing and pushing and pushing to make sure that the individual is respected and that the individual is valued. This is yet another place where that great American tradition of people standing up and saying what exists today is wrong, we can do better and we will do better should occur. I have great faith in this country. I have great faith in our history. I have great faith in the power of individual Americans to make a difference. And I guess in the end, the reason I agreed to do this interview was to beg the people watching, live up to the legacy of our forefathers and foremothers. Do not accept something that is wrong. Do what our ancestors did. Stand up, push for change, and don't quit until you get it. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for people who did that for us. It is time for us to deliver the same better world to the next generation that our forefathers and foremothers delivered to us.